For many people, the word magic conjures images of demonic pacts, strange rituals and witches dancing in the woods. The reality is that magic is way broader than that. It's all around us, casting its spell in our daily lives and most of us don't even realize. From an occult perspective, magic can be defined as the art and science of manipulating reality in accordance with one's will. The magician is essentially a reality engineer, bringing about desired changes in human consciousness and the substance of the world. Magic is now fully mainstream. We are constantly bombarded with its imagery and philosophy through TV, film and music. To appreciate how this happened, we need to take a brief journey into the past. Magic has experienced multiple resurgences through history. It was part and parcel of Europe's indigenous folk religions, only to be marginalized and driven underground as a result of Christianization. Later, during the Tudor period when magic and science intersected, astrologers occupied the royal courts and had the ear of Queen Elizabeth I herself. In the centuries that followed, there was widespread hysteria that witches were operating as an organized threat to Christianity and witch hunts subsequently swept through the West. In England, King James I passed the 1604 Act Against Witchcraft, which made it mandatory to hang convicted witches, regardless of whether they had caused any harm to others. Europe and its American colonies tortured and executed thousands of women accused of witchcraft. Physical persecution eventually gave way to intellectual challenges upon the arrival of the Age of Enlightenment ushering in scepticism and with it a rejection of all things supernatural. The 20th century birthed the biggest magical revival in the West with the counterculture movement of the 1960s, when the youth rejected the Christian norms of their parents and turned to New Age spirituality. The occult has been steadily increasing in popularity ever since. New Age spirituality, which has the trappings of organized religion, but little of their dogmatism, is naturally appealing to Westerners who are spiritually malnourished as a result of unfulfilling worldviews such as atheism and agnosticism. In terms of ingraining magic into popular culture, Harry Potter has had arguably the biggest impact. It is the most successful fantasy book series ever published, exposing an entire generation of children to magic. In the fiction genre, magic was typically portrayed as a dark art. But in the world of Harry Potter, there is good and bad magic. Once magic entered the mainstream and got more exposure, it was inevitable that its tools would become more widely used. The most influential magicians today are not wizards or witches, but rather the media and entertainment industries, advertisers, and political spin doctors who use occult principles to manipulate reality on a mass scale, causing millions to dance to their tunes. They spellbind, enchant, and charm us constantly, they stoke desires and generate fears designed to influence the behavior of as many people as possible. How can one identify the occult and its machinations? Some Muslims claim that Illuminati hand gestures that are popular with certain celebrities such as musicians are a sign that they are into magic and Satanism. Most entertainers are likely just capitalizing on the occult's notoriety, a marketing tactic that has been successfully utilized for decades to cause controversy and make money. Real magic is far more subtle. Genuine occultists understand that magic is at its most potent when it operates at the subconscious level. This is because the conscious mind is seen as an obstacle. Not only is the conscious mind critical, but it also has certain assumptions about how the universe operates and can therefore work to counteract a magician's desires from manifesting. Magicians try to bypass the critical conscious mind by planting ideas into the subconscious in the hope that they can affect people at a deep level, subtly pushing the target towards a desired goal without them even realizing it. This is one reason why symbols are a powerful magical tool. Symbols are a compression or abstraction of complex ideas and concepts into their simplest representations and hence can be more easily planted into the subconscious. Dr. A.K. Pradeep is widely considered the world's leading neuromarketing researcher. He concluded that 95% of our decisions are driven subconsciously. Given that the subconscious is the part of our brains that is most susceptible to programming and hypnotic suggestion, we should not be surprised that corporations have latched onto these concepts. 
Symbols that are widely seen can seed the minds of the larger population and bring about real-world changes. Corporate logos are a good example of the use of symbolism. The FedEx logo with its esoteric arrow hidden in plain sight is a prime example. Arrows convey feelings of speed and accuracy, and hence an ability to reliably transport items to their destination. Creating branded logos that are subtle yet packed with meaning is no easy task, and part of the reason why competent designers are highly coveted. Grant Morrison, an occultist and one of the most influential comic book writers in history, explains the correlations between marketing and magic. Corporate sigils are super breeders. They attack unbranded imaginative space. They invade Red Square. They infest the cranky streets of Tibet. They etch themselves into hairstyles. They breed across clothing, turning people into advertising hoardings. They are a very powerful development in the history of sigil magic, which dates back to the first bison drawn on the first cave wall. The logo or brand, like any sigil, is a condensation, a compressed symbolic summing up of the world of desire, which the corporation intends to represent. Corporate entities are worth studying and can teach the observant magician much about what we really mean when we use the word magic. They and other ghosts like them rule our world of the early 21st century. Psychologists have even picked up on these occult principles. Subliminal priming is a research method by which a subject is exposed to stimuli below the threshold of conscious detection, in order to explore the unconscious mind. Many studies have been undertaken and show that people can be subconsciously primed to act differently. For example, one study found that subconsciously priming white Americans with the word black made them respond faster to negative stereotypes in a later word task. So far, we've been analysing magic purely from a scientific perspective. But the act of magic is considered by occultists to be an art as well as a science. For many artists, their work is undertaken for the purposes of simple entertainment or aesthetics. For occultists, however, art can have a transformative effect on the world. When occultists create alternative universes in artistic mediums such as a book, film or song, they do so on the basis of certain divine principles. For example, the hermetic principle of as above, so below, which is the idea that higher realms or planes of existence, such as the universe, are connected to the lower realms. So, when an occultist creates art, they are not merely writing words on a page or dabbing paint on a canvas. Rather, they believe that they are creating a microcosm, and through the principles of hermeticism, that microcosm affects macrocosmic change. In other words, their art sets into motion a current of manifestation in the real world that's a reflection of the creator's original intention. Some artists have gotten so caught up in their fictional worlds that they have prophesied events that happen in reality. This might even explain why certain artistic works can sometimes unknowingly predict the future, either through their influence on the world or because the jinn used the artists as mediums through which to convey news of the unseen. Please refer to my previous video on divination for more information about how this works. When it comes to artistic mediums, the most influential innovation is the video recorder. The ability to fix sound and moving images permanently is an atom bomb in the hands of an occultist when combined with magical principles. Just look at how much television, cinema and popular music have shaped our reality. There's a reason for their potency because images and sound are the most powerful microcosm creation tools that go under the radar of logic and rationality and makes a convincing emotional experience that hits the limbic system on a deep level and therefore gets the greatest response from people. That is the seductive power of images and sound. They work outside of rigorous logic, bypassing their way straight into our emotionally driven subconscious. The most effective images and sounds speak to primal instincts such as pleasure, love and fear. Advertisers have also latched onto these concepts. Perhaps the most famous example of emotional manipulation in advertising is by De Beers, the company that runs the world's diamond cartel. Each year, the world's mines yield significantly more gem diamonds than is needed for jewellery. In short, there is an abundant supply of diamonds. Why then do they cost so much? Early on, the men who ran De Beers realised that diamonds had little intrinsic value, and their price depended almost entirely on their scarcity. After monopolising the market, 
they set the ambitious goal of creating a situation where almost every man pledging marriage feels compelled to acquire a diamond engagement ring. They devised a campaign around sentiment, promoting the idea that diamonds were a gift of love, and therefore the larger and finer the diamond, the greater the expression of love. This was accompanied by emotive slogans such as diamonds are forever. The result? Sales rose exponentially, growing from a multi-million dollar industry to a multi-billion dollar industry, all within just a few decades. This campaign is considered one of the most successful in the history of advertising, having manifested a reality where marriage proposals have become synonymous with diamond rings. With the powerful transformative effect that art has, we should not be surprised that morality has shifted more in the last century than at any other period in history, as during this time frame we have witnessed the birth and rise of Hollywood, the spread of television into every household, and an oversaturation of entertainment that, thanks to the advent of streaming technology, is now available on demand 24-7. Even the most deplorable, filthy acts can resonate emotionally with an audience when skilled artists present them in an attractive package of witty dialogue, empathetic characters and a moving soundtrack. Manipulation through appeals to emotion just happens to be one of the oldest tricks in Satan's playbook. The Quran informs us that Satan successfully used this tactic in order to deceive and evict our forefather Adam from paradise. And God said, O Adam, Dwell, you and your wife, in paradise, and eat from wherever you will. But do not approach this tree, lest you be among the wrongdoers. But Satan whispered to them to make apparent to them that which was concealed from them of their private parts. He said, Your Lord did not forbid you this tree, except that you become angels or become of the immortal. And he swore by God to them, Indeed, I am to you from among the sincere advisers. So he made them fall through deception. The act of disobeying God by eating from the forbidden tree was an evil one that was beautified through Satan's manipulative choice of words. Satan first took an oath of sincerity, disarming them, and secondly appealed to their emotions when he said they would become angels or of the immortal. Although Adam and Eve were surrounded by the finest of permissible foods, fruits of paradise no less, Satan was still able to convince them to eat from the worst of trees by tugging at their heartstrings. Another magical practice that has been picked up on by the mainstream is the manipulation of language. In fact, the very word grammar comes from grimoire, which is a book of spells. Indeed, to cast a spell is simply to spell words, with the goal of changing people's consciousness. The association between magic and the spoken word is an ancient one. In Egypt, the acts of speaking and magic were treated as more or less equivalent. In Mesopotamia, incantations had to be pronounced in a special tone of voice. The idea that language affects the way we view the external world, and therefore how we behave, will be familiar to students of linguistics. Studies have shown that even the most minor of language choices can create false memories and eyewitnesses of events. For example, one experiment had participants watch a video of an automobile accident. When asked about what they had witnessed, questions containing indefinite articles such as did you see a broken headlight produced far more uncertain responses than questions which contained a definite article such as did you see the broken headlight. In other words, the simple use of a definite article can influence people's reality to the extent that it can make them recall events that had never occurred. Creating something out of nothing is the very essence of magic. Another form of language manipulation is doublespeak. Doublespeak is basically the strategic manipulation of words in order to distort reality and influence thought, but without directly lying. The acts of misdirection and hiding things in plain sight are, again, a cult in nature. Some examples of doublespeak include describing slaughterhouses using more palatable phrases such as meat processing plants giving fake goods oxymoronic labels such as real counterfeit diamonds or genuine imitation leather, positively spinning corporate firings and layoffs as workforce adjustments or negative employee retention. While such examples might be somewhat humorous, matters take a far more sinister turn when it comes to the military. Perhaps the most outrageous example is governments rebranding war departments and ministries as departments of defence or ministries of defence. 
At first glance, such changes may not seem to be all that significant, but the implications are far-reaching. Governments can now more easily justify spending billions on defence in the minds of taxpayers. If a political party pledges to reduce military spend, then opposition parties who are pro-war can create fear in the minds of the public by charging their opponents with compromising public safety. The military is acutely aware that the reason for its existence is to wage war, and war means killing and maiming people. Because the reality of war and its consequences are so harsh, the military almost instinctively turns to doublespeak. For example, innocent civilians who are killed and wounded are simply collateral damage. Initiating conflict is described as a preemptive strike. Accidentally killing one's own troops is referred to as friendly casualties. People who are illegally arrested and tortured are described as detainees. Such military doublespeak is not a new use of language peculiar to the 20th century. In ancient Rome, Julius Caesar, in his account of the Gallic Wars, described his brutal and bloody conquest as pacifying Gaul. The Nazis called their genocide of Jews a final solution. When the Japanese emperor announced his country's surrender in the Second World War, he said that the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. Politicians and political spin doctors use doublespeak to manipulate the masses all the time. In his 1946 essay, Politics and the English Language, the visionary novelist George Orwell wrote, In our time, political speech and writing are largely the defence of the indefensible. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question-begging and sheer cloudy vagueness. Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable. George Orwell understood well the power of language as both a tool and a weapon. In the nightmare world of his famous novel 1984, Orwell depicted a society where language was one of the most important tools of the totalitarian state. Newspeak, the official state language in the world of 1984, was designed not to extend, but to diminish the range of human thought, to make only correct thought possible, and all other modes of thought impossible. It was, in short, a language designed to create a reality that the state wanted. In this video, we have seen that in the world of the occult, magic goes far beyond spells and demons, spanning areas as diverse as psychology, language, and art. This broader understanding of magic is in line with Islam, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, informed us that some eloquent speech is a kind of magic. Even the Arabic word for magic, sihr, gives us great insight, as it is linguistically defined as every effect whose cause is subtle or mysterious. This is irrespective of whether the causes of the effects are tangible or intangible, natural or supernatural. As long as the causes remain concealed, the circumstances can be linguistically described as sihr. Now, the people and organisations who make use of such occult principles do not necessarily set out to do magic, even if their intention is to corrupt thought and manipulate behaviour. From the perspective of the Sharia, such actions do not make one a magician or guilty of practising magic. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate just how pervasive this broader understanding of magic has become, and that many of us are exposed to it in our daily lives and influenced by it without even realising. By raising awareness, we can more easily recognise and therefore better protect ourselves against the manipulation of others, whether it be socially, politically or economically. To learn more about the occult from an Islamic perspective, please download your free copy of the book, The Forbidden Prophecies, at the link below.